So the first talk we're dealing with this morning to get things underway is called The Great Commission. This is a talk where we really set the big picture of evangelization as understood by the church. It means we're going to paint with very large brush strokes, talk about sort of the overall big picture of what evangelization is, and many of these things we're going to come back to as we go on through the, uh, through the course and deal with in a lot more detail. So if some of these things you have more questions about, don't worry, we're going to come back to them. Uh, but we need to sort of set the big picture first, the parameters. So we start right at the beginning. What do we mean by evangelization? Well, the church defines evangelization in, in a number of different ways. First way is, of course, literally, what does the word mean? It's from the Greek, which means to bring the good news. Very simple at that level. But the church in her wisdom also realizes that there's a great deal in that that needs to be unpacked and unraveled. So when we speak of defining evangelization, we also have to define what we mean by the goal of evangelization. For the church, evangelizing means bringing the good news into all the strata of humanity. And through its influence, transforming humanity from within and making it new. Now I am making the whole creation new. This is how Pope Paul VI sets out for us the goal of evangelization. His very famous encyclical, encyclical Evangelii Nuziandi, on evangelization in the modern world in 1975. So when we're talking about evangelization, very often we can start to think about, well, I do this, or I do this, or someone hands out a track on the street, or someone knocks on a door. But on the, the first thing we have to realize is when the church is talking about the goal, it's the whole goal of salvation history, the transformation of all creation. So it's huge in its scope. And then we look at the means. How, how is that accomplished? How is that carried out? Once again, Paul VI from Evangeli Nuziandi, the church evangelizes when she seeks to convert solely by the divine power of the message she proclaims. This is what we, this is the means of evangelization. That's how we define the means. When the church um, seeks to convert solely by the divine power of the message she proclaims. We'll come to that and talk about that a great deal more as we, uh, as we advance. So the first thing, the first big picture we want to look at is the cycle of evangelization. As I just said, when, when the church speaks about evangelization, we're talking about something very big, we're talking about the renewal of all humanity. We're talking about the power of God unleashed as in nowhere else. So we want to get a feel for what is the whole cycle? What does it entail? When we say evangelization, where does it begin and where does it end? So once again, Pope Paul VI sort of draws for us a bit of a wheel or a cycle of evangelization so we can pe begin to put down pegs and understand where it begins and where it moves to. He warns us in Evangelii Nuziandi, and I'll read the, uh, the, the comment for you, any partial or fragmentary definition which attempts to render the reality of evangelization in all its richness, its complexity, and dynamism does so only at the risk of impoverishing it or even distorting it. It is impossible to grasp the concept of evangelization unless one tries to keep in view all its essential elements. So it's a whole package. It has a beginning, it has an end, and every, por every part is important. And we need to think in terms of that because the Pope is telling us if we take one piece out of the whole, it begins to distort the message. It begins to distort the work of the church. Does that make sense? In Ghana, everybody answers, Amen, when you say, uh, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Amen. All right. Coming to life. So what is the first step on the cycle of evangelization? Above all, we are told, the gospel must be proclaimed by witness. As Pope Paul VI explains in that quote, take a, a group of Christians, take a handful of Christians who are deeply living gospel life, who have allowed God to transform their lives and are living the gospel to a very deep degree. That in itself will draw people to Christ. That in itself 
will raise questions in our hearts that are irresistible. Why do they live like this? Where does the hope come from? And it draws people to ask deeper questions of themselves and of the Christians. When we live the gospel deeply and witness, it opens the door for the rest of the cycle to take place. It allows people to see the fruits of what we're proclaiming as authentic. It gives us credibility and draws people in. Tremendously powerful. Through this wordless witness, these Christians stir up irresistible questions in the hearts of those who see how they live. Such a witness, Paul tells us, Pope Paul VI, such a witness is already a silent proclamation of the good news and a very powerful and effective one. Here we have an initial act of evangelization. We're already beginning to evangelize, to bring the good news, to transform humanity by the divine power of God, by living the gospel deeply. It has a power even on its own. We move then uh, to the second cycle, which follows directly upon it. And it is proclamation. So as important as witness is, we are told it just, it is leading to something else. On its own, it is incomplete. Nevertheless, Pope Paul VI tells us, nevertheless, this witness, as important, as key, as crucial, as foundational as it is, this witness always remains insufficient. On its own, it always remains insufficient. Because even the finest witness will prove ineffective in the long run if it's not explained and justified. So a holy life, the witness of gospel living is going to put questions in the hearts of people. But we have to answer those questions. We have to speak the truth of why we live this way, of where we find our hope. Proclamation is a necessary complement to witness. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. All right. Paul VI goes on to say, there is no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom, and the mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, are not proclaimed. Wow, that'll get your attention, won't it? There is no true evangelization if we don't use the name, the teaching, the promises, the kingdom of Jesus. It necessarily moves. Witness moves to proclamation. Proclamation, we're told by John Paul II in his famous encyclical on uh, evangelization, the mission of the Redeemer. He says, proclamation is the permanent priority of mission. It's the priority. We we want to get from there to there. This is where we want to be. This is a priority for us. Evangelization will always contain, as the foundation, center, and summit of its dynamism, a clear proclamation that in Jesus Christ, salvation is offered to all people as a gift of God's grace and mercy. Once again, he says uh, a nice little summary of all this. Just as the whole Economy of salvation has its center of Christ, in Christ. You know, everything before Christ in the economy of salvation, everything God did before Christ was moving to him. Then he came, and everything in salvation history from that time has flowed from him. It's right there. It's on the crucial spot. It's critical. Just as the whole economy of salvation has its center in Christ, so too... All missionary activity is directed to the proclamation of this mystery. So everything that we do beforehand is moving to proclamation, and everything we do afterward flows from our proclamation. It's that key linchpin. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> proclamation, of course, then moves. Moves to our third step. Discipleship. What do we mean when we talk about discipleship? Well, there's three essential things that we're talking about. The first is a deep relationship with Jesus. Pope John Paul II made this comment to the bishops of southern Germany. 
It is necessary to awaken in believers a full relationship with Christ, mankind's only Savior. Only from a personal relationship with Jesus can ev effective evangelization develop. So our proclamation should bring people into a relationship to Jesus as, as their personal Savior, as their Lord. Even before we begin to speak about the Lord of the church or whatever else, which is all true, there's a meant to be a personal element there, a pull, a, an authentic relationship forming between Jesus and the one who's being evangelized. Discipleship also means being formed by Jesus. The church needs to listen unceasingly to what she must believe, to her reasons for hoping, to the new commandment of love. She has a constant need of being evangelized if she wishes to retain freshness, vigor, and strength in order to proclaim the gospel. We are always being fed. We are always growing in relationship to the Lord as a church, as a parish, as individuals. That must never stop. That relationship needs to be uh, deepened to grow in and through our life. It doesn't, it's not a one-time event. I met the Lord. He touched my life. And then that's it. It should be something which is ongoing, deepening, developing through our entire life. St. Bonaventure calls the Christian life an adventure in God because we're deepening our love relationship with him and he is taking us to new places, enriching our hearts, our minds. The whole time, we're going deeper. So it's being formed by Jesus. And then following from that, discipleship is believing and following Jesus in day-to-day -day life. In fact, the proclamation only reaches full development when it is listened to, accepted, assimilated, when it arouses the genuine adherence in the one who has thus received it, an adherence to the truths which the Lord in his mercy has revealed, still more an adherence to a program of life, a, hence, a life henceforth transformed, which he proposes. So discipleship leads us into a transformation of life. This relationship with the Lord bears fruit in a day-to-day -day living. It can be seen day to day. Our lives become affected. We begin to change and to grow in the Lord. And we live a certain kind of life. We live a transformed life by the power of grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. As disciples, then, we speak of community because we are not Christians alone. We are not lone ranger on our own. We are part of something. We are part of the community. Now, you can tell already that something could be changed here depending on how someone experiences God, right? I may have grown up in the church. I may have been a cradle Catholic. And so therefore, I'm probably going to experience community prior to experiencing discipleship. Because I don't know many four-year-olds that are talking about how Jesus is affecting their day-to-day -day life, right? It's something which grows within the bosom of the church, within the womb of the church. They become the disciples they're called to be. Probably that's more the norm. However, uh, more and more, the case is becoming, you know, as more and more people are unbaptized, discipleship coming first, a preparation. This is what RCIA has in mind, to enter deeply into the life of faith, to become formed in Jesus so that we may enter into the community in sort of a definitive manner and become a member of that living body. All right, community. It also means several different things. It means initiation into the church. Those whose life has been transformed enter a community which is itself a sign of transformation. It is the church, the visible sacrament of salvation. We're going to talk a lot more about that, I think, on day four. But just to make the point, we enter into the life of the church. Adherence to the church and the sacraments is another aspect. In the dynamism of evangelization, a person who accepts the church as the word which saves normally translate it, translates it into the following sacramental acts. Adherence to the church and acceptance of the sacraments. So through the church, we live the life of God. Because the church 
through her sacred magisterium, through her teaching, informs us on the fullness of faith. We're not alone. We have guidance into the fullness of truth, and we are fed. We are given life, strengthened by the sacraments. We receive the Eucharist. Our sins are forgiven in confession. So we enter into the full life of the community here. And then finally, we speak of mission itself. This is Pope Paul VI, once again, in Evangelii Nuziendi. Finally, the person who has been evangelized goes on to evangelize others. Here lies the test of truth, the touchstone of evangelization. It is unthinkable. This is Paul VI now. It is unthinkable that a person should accept the word and give himself to the kingdom without becoming a person who bears witness to it and proclaims it in his turn. It is absolutely unthinkable in the mind of the church that we can receive the witness of truth. The gospel could be proclaimed to us in a life-giving way. That we enter into a deep relationship with Jesus. Become his disciples. Become ones who follow him and pattern our lives on him. To enter into the very life of his church where he teaches us and feeds us and transforms us and then not ourselves be on mission not ourselves, take all that we've received to others. Unthinkable, Paul VI tells us. So there's the cycle of evangelization. The church is looking at it in the big picture. As a church, this is the life of the church, as we'll talk about more later. Now, we'll also talk about, you know, we have particular places that we might take in ministry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I want to make a few general comments about this this uh, cycle of evangelization. Now, when you look at that cycle, and with your experience, you know, here and now, today, your own parish life, what would you say we as Catholics are strong on? What would you say we're strong on in this wheel? The average person, you ask them about Catholicism or their, their feelings about Catholicism, what are they going to, what are they going to say? Any ideas? Community, yes, especially the sacraments. We, you know, when you think of a Catholic, you think of someone who receives the sacraments, somebody who is drawing life from the Eucharist and from confession, the other sacraments, right? So definitely, that would be one area, community, which is, which is uh, strong, especially the sacramental aspect of it. What else would you say when the average person thinks about Catholics would be strong in there? Okay, yes, we've traditionally had many missionaries, but do most people sort of look at a Catholic and think, okay, he's probably going to want to tell me about Jesus or, okay. Witness. You think of Catholics, you think of the holy cards that they've got in their fridge door, right? And of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. You know, the witness of the holiness of their life, of the other saints who have lived incredible lives of deep holiness, of, of all the, the various outreaches of mercy that the church undertakes, feeding the poor and, and clothing the naked and giving drink to the thirsty. This is something which usually most people, I know when I wasn't a Catholic, that's what would come to mind. Uh, so we're also, in that sense, strong in witness. Where would you say we're kind of weak, especially right now? Proclamation. Proclamation would be definitely something where we would consider ourselves not, not in top shape at this time, right? At least not in this part of the world. What's another one, perhaps? We already mentioned it, but mission. All right. What would you say our Protestant brothers and sisters are strong on? Proclamation, definitely. I heard discipleship, yes, very definitely discipleship. Great emphasis on becoming, coming into a personal relationship with Jesus and growing in that, right? All right. What would you say that they're maybe a little weak on, our Protestant brothers and sisters? It's hard to generalize that way, but I'm throwing out a blanket statement, you know. What would, what would you say they might be weaker on? Well, certainly we would say as Catholics, the sacraments, right? I mean... 
I love uh, many of my Protestant brothers and sisters, and I would go to one of their services, and there'd be great preaching, and there'd be great worship. And I'm getting all excited here because, you know, I know it's going somewhere, and then it's, they're done. What? Where's the Eucharist? Where's the sacraments, you know? So that would be one area, perhaps, where we would say they're a little weaker on. All right. So in this school, this is why we're particularly focusing on proclamation and mission. We are going to cover the other things, and we do spend time with them, but we focus specifically, or, or more particularly, on proclamation and mission, because in our context, at this time, this is where we, as a church, need to grow. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, when we look at this uh, cycle as well, we begin to realize something, that it's meant to move. I didn't put the arrows in very well, but there's a movement it's a dynamic movement. What happens when one stage of the cycle is weak? What happens when one stage, whatever it might be, is weak? Well, what it does, it's almost like, uh, a, you know, the river gets dammed up. You know, it doesn't move as powerfully to the next stage as it should. If we're weak in witness, are people really going to be wanting to ask us about Jesus? If we're real living, you know, a really mediocre, very, you know, questionable life, is that going to stimulate questions that people want answered? They're going to say, wow, where do you get your hope? What do you... They're going to look at you and go, well, whatever, you know, sure, that's fine for you, that's great. They'll be thinking in their mind, hypocrisy, you know. So that's one example. Um, if we get into a nice, holy huddle in community, we're just hanging out together, and we're having a lot of fun, you know, and uh, it could be very easy to forget that we're called here, you know. If we're not, if we don't have that place, you know, if our, or if our community is, is very weak, you know, well, do I really want to bring some? Am I excited to bring somebody into this community? I'm excited to bring somebody here and show them the life and the goodness. I'm talking to someone about Jesus. Do I really want to bring them to a parish where, you know, Sunday Mass is 35 minutes and, you know, it's just, it's lifeless and nobody talks to each other and there's, you, you see what I'm saying? So, and a weakness in one can affect the whole, whole, um, the whole movement. In fact, many people who don't experience community life, they don't experience acceptance, love, warmth, generosity. They don't accept, don't experience that. What do they do often? You know, they start slipping over to another church because they welcomed me there. They know my name. They, they welcomed me at the door. They, they took an interest in my life. They cared about me as a person. But when I was in this, well, you know, I sat behind, I sat in the fourth pew, and I didn't even know the people around me, and nobody ever shook hands. And so we've got to be aware that that, that is always a danger, that we need to... Um, be strong in all the areas. Also, uh, need for response. How can you move from one if the other one, if the first one, the preceding one, has not been done? You know? For example, um, can we really disciple people who have not yet heard the proclamation of the gospel? Can you really bring them into a deep relationship with the Lord if they can't even appreciate why a relationship with the Lord's important? You know? So this is something that's very, very critical as well, especially when we're dealing with these two, uh, others as well. But I mean, the church herself has pointed out that part of our struggle today is we're trying to catechize people. We're trying to catechize people and sacramentalize people who have never heard the gospel. They have never heard that initial proclamation of who Jesus is, why he came, what he did for us, and his love for us, and his desire to be in relationship, and our need to respond. If we don't respond here, these will be at best very ineffective and very superficial and probably won't stick. Amen? Amen. Deeds and words. Very often there's a lot of confusion about this. You have often, you've probably seen the t-shirt that has a beautiful quote from St. Francis of Assisi that says, evangelize always and when necessary use words. 
Now, we need to understand something, that St. Francis was not saying, therefore, I'm giving you an easy scapegoat so that you don't have to say anything. Just be a nice person and you won't ever have to say anything. It's not what he was saying. St. Francis was crazy for the gospel. This man, he was a man on fire. He was, you couldn't hold him down. He was so anxious to proclaim the gospel. At the end of his life, he's laying there, you know, his eyes blinded, he's got sicknesses, he's riddled with everything, and... You know, he's basically, they're waiting for him to die, and he's like, somebody get my mule. i got to go evangelize, you know. <laughs> like, put him on top of it and carry him out to another town because he's saying, I haven't even begun yet. So filled was he with the passion to proclaim, to, to, to help people know the truth of who he was. It emphasizes we do need to live a holy life, but it needs to be lived out. I'm going to move through this very quickly. Peter Herbeck in uh, Renewal Ministries newsletter, I'm going to read this just to summarize. There is a mystery hidden in our good works. The mystery is the love of Christ. People need not only to see what we're doing, but they need to know why we're doing it. They need to know the truth behind the deeds. After all, the first act of charity is truth. That is the greatest, most important act of charity the church can do for anyone is to reveal to them the truth about Jesus Christ. And in that, provide the only antidote to the despair and sickness of spirit that is literally killing every human heart. It's not enough to relieve people of physical suffering. Only the church can relieve the pain of eternal suffering. All right, words and deeds are bound up together, Vatican II tell us. They work together. They're meant to uh, reinforce and strengthen one another. The urgency of proclamation and mission. 2,000 years after Jesus gave the Great Commission, the Holy Father reminds us, the peoples who have not yet received an initial proclamation of Christ constitute the majority of humanity. The majority of people in the world haven't even heard of Jesus. 2,000 years later, Catholics make up, we're told, about 17% of the world's population. After 2,000 years. And what percentage of those are actually practicing their faith, but are, as the Catechism says, Catholics in name, and not so much in substance, right? Well, in the United States, statistics tell us about 40% practice their faith. And what do they mean by practicing their faith? Do you mean they go there on Christmas and Easter to Mass? You know, that's questionable as well. In Canada, in 1950, 75% of Catholics were practicing their faith. In the year 2000, it was down to 32%. In one generation, it had dropped 43%. In Quebec in 1950, 88% of Catholics practiced their faith. By the year 2000, 20% were practicing their faith. And I've been told that that's probably somewhat generous. A drop of 68%. Peter Herbeck once again, in the face of these grave statistics, the Holy Father, John Paul II, has spoken prophetically of the unfolding of a new missionary age for the church and a new springtime of Christian life, which will lead to a great harvest of souls in the new millennium. The Holy Father tells us in Ecclesia in America, a summary of the church's life in America, that this is particularly urgent today for those of us who live in the Americas, speaking of North and South America. Do not be afraid to go out to the streets and into public places like the first apostles who preached Christ and the good news of salvation in the squares of cities and towns and villages. This is no time to be ashamed of the gospel. It is a time to preach it from the rooftops. Uh, Ralph Martin, in a wonderful book, The Catholic Church at the End of the Age, basically shows us a phenomena where Jesus is lifted up and proclaimed with confidence and joy in the power of the Holy Spirit. Many are attracted to him and the church grows. Where the message is not clear, where there is doctrinal and moral confusion, where Jesus is not at the center, where the Holy Spirit is not free to move, hardly anyone comes, and many who are already there are leaving for practical paganism or other churches. It is urgent in our time that we get on side with this, with the proclamation. Many people ask, if you ask many people, why does the church exist? Probably a great many would say, well, it's a political organization, it's a social movement, it's a philosophy of life, et cetera, et cetera, right? Amen? How does the press think of us in, that term, in those terms? It's always political terms, right? If you ask the average person on the, st on the street or, uh, or the average Catholic, what would they say? The average Catholic in the pew, why does the church exist? 
What are some things you might hear? To make money, yeah? Why does the church, what else? What are some other things that you might hear from a nominal Catholic? To make people feel good, yeah, that's why I go to church, to feel good. What else? To do good works, maybe, to carry out, you know, we need somebody to baptize and bury us and, and marry us and all that stuff, you know, we need, yeah, get married later, et cetera, et cetera, yes. So they would think of it in those terms. What does the church say about herself? Let's read from Evangelii Nuziandi again. We wish to confirm once more that the task of evangelizing all people constitutes the essential mission of the church. Evangelizing is in fact the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists to evangelize. The church is linked to evangelization in her inmost being. The church exists to evangelize. It's the reason that she's here. It's her very existence. The church is missionary by her very nature. She cannot do other than proclaim the gospel. That's pretty strong. Those are strong words, aren't they? At every phase of human history, the church constantly gripped by the desire to evangelize has but one preoccupation, whom to send to proclaim the mystery of Jesus. Oh, hello. Is your parish constantly gripped by one preoccupation, who to send to proclaim the mystery of Jesus? Is that what we, most of us are experiencing on Sunday? We fall far short of this, don't we? But this, the Pope is telling us, is what it's all about. This is the hunger, this is the desire of the church. This is why she exists in the first place. We are seeing a movement in the church's history at our time. A very critical juncture that we're at in the life of the church. In the 19th century, in the 1800s, the church focused mainly on maintaining the status quo in a largely Christian world. Everybody was baptized, everybody believed, with very few exceptions. Everybody was involved some way or another. The whole center of the life of most towns was around the parish church. And so where was mission territory? Over there somewhere. Some foreign place on the coast of Africa or, or Asia or somewhere else. The, you said the missions, you thought, somewhere in some exotic climate, climate or whatever, you know, something over there. But by the mid-20th century, all that had begun to change. Radical secularization, aggressive atheistic ideologies, the social and sexual revolution, it really changed everything. It changed everything. Now the mission territory is where? Here. It's our own backyard all of a sudden. We think of missions, we start right here. The church has moved from a maintenance mentality where we're just keeping Catholics Catholic, where we're giving them the sacraments, giving them what they need, and sending missions over there somewhere to being radically missionary even here. A movement from maintenance to mission, here and now. Maintenance to mission. This is key to understand what's happening in the church today, what the Holy Father is pointing to. All right. In Vatican I, the Council of the last century in 1869-1870, you know how many times they use the word gospel or evangelium? Once in the whole council. And that's not an indictment of them. They were dealing with a Christian world to bring the good news to people who have already got the good news is not your most pressing concern, right? How about Vatican II? Less than a century later, it mentioned gospel 157 times, used the verb evangelize 18 times, and the noun evangelization 31 times. It permeates the documents of Vatican II. It really is the heart and center of what the church is saying is the signs of our times, this move from maintenance to mission. 
John Paul II has identified this shift by the title, The New Evangelization. In The Mission of the Redeemer, he wrote, God is opening before the church the horizons of a humanity more fully prepared for the sowing of the gospel. I sense the moment has come to a new evangelization and to the mission ad gentes, or to the nations. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. It doesn't get much stronger than that in language. The supreme duty to proclaim the gospel to all peoples. What are we talking about, the new evangelization? You know, we, we defined it before. Is this something new? Well, Cardinal Avery Dulles explains it for us. Evangelization, the Pope insists, cannot be new in content, since its theme is always the one gospel given by Jesus Christ. It arose from ourselves and from our situation, he says. It would not be gospel, but mere human invention, and there would be no salvation in it. So if we made up something different, there'd be no salvation in it. So we're not talking about changing the message at all. Evangelization, however, can and, be sh and should be new in its ardor, its methods, and its expression. Its ardor, its methods, and its expression. It must be heralded with new energy and in a style and language adapted to the people of our day. So this urgency has to be translated into a new ardor, new techniques, a new zeal. That's what is meant by the new evangelization. Now, who are these new evangelists, and where do we find them? What do they look like? Well, look left, look right, look behind you, look around you. All Christians. Now, this is an important statement, especially for those who are raised in the church perhaps pre-conciliar times, before Vatican II, or even in the years just following Vatican II. No longer reserved to clerics and religious with a special missionary vocation, evangelization is now seen as the responsibility of the whole church. Vatican II had already taught that since the church is missionary by her very nature, evangelization is the duty of every Christian. Once again, that is Cardinal Dulles making reference to the documents of Vatican II. There was a time, I don't need to worry about evangelism. That's what we have father for. That's what sister does. I'm just raising my family, you know, like they're taking care of all that. But you can see how that's tied to a Christian culture, right? Everything has changed. All Christians, all Christians, no matter what our vocation or state in life, by virtue of our very baptism, we're called to be the new evangelists. That has always been the case, but it's been rediscovered. Now, the laity, it seems silly to have to say it, but many places it's just not understood. The laity are called to proclaim the gospel. The laity are called to proclaim the gospel. The laity are where father and sister can never be. The gospel has to penetrate into the marketplace into the workplace, into families, extended families. I don't work in the industry. I don't work in marketing. I don't work in whatever, in the universities. It's like, but you do. The lay people do. And they're called to take that gospel and to penetrate and permeate all of society. Remember what Paul VI said? Our goal is to transform humanity. It's a whole new creation. Every corner of it. And we all have a place of influence, a place that we are brought, a light to shine in the dark places. Amen? Amen? The lay faithful, too, precisely as members of the church, have the vocation and mission of proclaiming the gospel. They are prepared for it, for this work by the sacraments of Christian initiation and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All right. We're moving down now. The progression of evangelization. This is another key concept. Coming uh, together with the cycle evangelization, this is another key concept that we really want you to be able to grasp this morning because it will affect everything else we do in the, uh, in the week. Evangelization, we need to understand, begins in the heart of God the Father. 
evangelization begins in the heart of the Lord. This wasn't something that some pope made up or had a great idea about. This wasn't a think session. We said, hey, what can we do? Well, let's, hey, I know. Let's, no. It begins right in the heart and the mind of God the Father. God desires all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15. God's saving love, Pope Paul VI tells us. The origin of all true evangelization is universal. There is not, nor ever will there be, any person or place or culture that God does not desire to transform through the hidden energy of the good news. He, it's his desire that everyone be touched by his love manifest in Jesus Christ and experienced in the Holy Spirit. Because of the fall, we came under the power of sin and death. Amen? You're with me? All right. Now, I'm going to give you just a little theology here. Just a little theology. Don't let it... Uh, panic here if you don't get the terms right away, but it's important to grasp it. There were three principal effects when we fell. One was we got alienated from God, right? We were no longer in this deep union with God. We were alienated from him. The second thing was that our very nature as human, human, human nature itself was warped, was somehow broken. You still with me? And the third one, the scriptures tell us that Satan, the enemy, took over a certain dominion in the world. The world being that which is opposed to God. Okay, not the world as creation which is good. You, you still with me? All right. Now when we're wounded, it means our, 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 our will is in bondage. Why do I do the things I do not want to do and the things I want to do I cannot do, right? We've all experienced something of that. Our intellect does not perceive reality as it should. We don't understand things as we should. We're darkened. We don't know who the Father is. We're unable to answer the fundamental questions of life. Who am I? Where do I come from? What am I going? What's life all about? That's an effect of the fall. And finally, our passions are disordered and in disarray. The Lord wants to remedy that. And the remedy comes right from his heart. It's expressed so beautifully in Eucharistic prayer number four. I'm just going to read it now. Even when he disobeyed you and lost your friendship, speaking of mankind, man, even when he disobeyed you and lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the power of death, but helped men to all, to all men to seek and find you. Again and again you offered a covenant to man, and through the prophets taught him to hope for salvation. Father, you so loved the world, that in the fullness of time you sent your only son to be our savior. God has a desperate need to restore us to his friendship and heal our wounded nature. And then finally at the second coming of Jesus to obliterate the enemy's influence altogether and take us to himself perfectly. And it all begins here in the Father's heart. The second step in the um, progression, not surprisingly, is the Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that whoever might believe in him shall not die but have eternal life. John 3.16. Christ comes to tell us who the Father is, the truth about who you are, to heal that darkened intellect, to show us who we are and what God's plan is in creating us, what we're made for. He came to reveal that to us to save us, to undo the damage, to restore us to the heart of the Father. If then we have died with Christ, St. Paul tells us, we believe we shall also live with him. We know that Christ raised from the dead dies no more. Death no longer has power over him. As to his death, he died to sin once for all, as, and to his life he lives for God. Consequently, you too, you too, must think of yourselves as dead to sin and alive for God in Christ Jesus. A beautiful summary. That's from Romans 6, verses 8 through 11. A beautiful summary of this incredible work that was born in the heart of God the Father and realized through Jesus. Amen? Amen. I get excited about this stuff. I figure if I can't get excited about this, I'm, I'm probably dead already. You know, I'm still under sin and death. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all of this is from God, 
All of this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us a ministry of reconciliation. And we'll come to that. The Father and the Son, not surprisingly, send, or as they say in Ghana, the Sun Sun Kron Kron, which is how you say Holy Spirit. Now, now I'm showing off here. It's the only word I learned in my entire time there. But it sounded so great that I had to ask them, what does that mean when you say that? Oh, it's Holy Spirit. Sun Sun Kron Kron. The Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit, all originating in the heart of the Father. The Son and the Holy Spirit have a joint mission, the church tells us. When the Father sends his word, who is Jesus, he also sends, he always sends his breath. His breath. The word in Hebrew for spirit is ruach, which means breath. In their joint mission, the Son and Holy Spirit are distinct but inseparable. You can't separate the Holy Spirit and Jesus. To be sure, it is Christ who is seen, the visible image of the invisible God, but it is the Spirit who reveals him. They're working together in a joint mission, born in the heart of the Father. As I keep saying, it's so important to understand that. Then the Holy Spirit sends the church. Now you can tell that I'm not an artist, but that's supposed to be the, the triple tiara of the Pope, sort of the papal flag, you know. It's a, if it looks like a skull and crossbones, it's not meant to be, all right? That's the other guy's work. The church. The Spirit sends the church. From this hour onward, the Catechism tells us in number 730, from this hour onward, the mission of Christ and the Spirit becomes the mission of the church. It becomes the mission of the church. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's all moving. It's come. The mission of the church is the mission of the Father and the Son and the, the plan born in the heart of the Father. And then the, through the Son and the Holy Spirit. Still with me? Amen? Amen. And then the church sends, I was going to do a happy face, but I thought maybe that wouldn't be so good. Well, Church sends us, okay? Sends us. The church herself sends out evangelizers. She puts on their lips the saving word. She explains to them the message, which she herself is the depository. She gives them the mandate, which she herself has received, and sends them out to preach. To preach not their own selves or their personal ideas, but a gospel of which neither she nor they are the absolute masters and owners to dispose of it as they wish, but a gospel of which they are ministers in order to pass it on with complete fidelity. We cannot do our own thing in evangelization because it is so much bigger than us. But how can we call on, how can the, they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how they, can they hear without someone to preach? And how can people preach unless they are sent? It all comes down here. This is a powerful thing to realize. Evangelization is a participation in the very Trinitarian life of God. Yeah, wow. You have a desire to tell someone about Jesus, to share what you've... That desire was born in the heart of God the Father who created the universe and is holding it in being. He put that desire in your heart to share the gospel. Every time you do anything for the advance of the kingdom of God, that's a work that was begun in the heart of God and carried out through the Son, the Holy Spirit, from the church and through the church to us. It's a powerful reality. Do you see all that is coming through our ministry? When you do the simple job of telling someone, proclaiming or living a holy life as, a, as witness, it's something so big and so powerful that the life of God himself, the Trinity, being poured out through us poor vessels. As St. Paul said, we're cracked pots, but we carry something of an estimable worth, right? What an amazing reality this is. Just to wrap up then, the Great Commission. Jesus commissioned us. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. Go, therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded, commanded you, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. It is Jesus who commissioned us. 
The Holy Spirit anoints us. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. And the church exhorts us. I'll just read uh, just one of them here. At the beginning of the church, the witness of personal conduct and explicit proclamation, whenever possible, was in fact considered the normal outcome of Christian living. The church in all her teaching exhorts us so strongly. So Jesus commissioned us. The Holy Spirit anoints us. The church exhorts us. We cannot be content, John Paul II says. We cannot be content when we consider the millions of our brothers and sisters who, like us, have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, but who live in ignorance of the love of God. For each believer, as for the entire church, the missionary task must remain foremost, for it concerns the eternal destiny of humanity and corresponds to God's mysterious and merciful plan. This is the big picture. This is painting in the broad strokes. We're going to go back and look at these things. But we need to understand to be Christians means to be missionaries, to be apostles. That's the words of our Holy Father at World Youth Day in 1989. And I'm going to finish by reading the whole quote. To be Christians means to be missionaries, to be apostles. It is not enough to discover Christ. You must bring him to others. You must have the courage to speak about Christ, to bear witness to your faith through a lifestyle inspired by the gospel. The harvest is great indeed for evangelization and so many workers are needed. Christ trusts you and counts on your collaboration. Christ trusts you and counts on your collaboration. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.